Turn to Exodus. We're in chapter 3. Um, as you're turning there, uh, i got to tell you this story. It's uh, about a 95-year-old widow. Uh, her fourth husband had just passed away, and um, her granddaughter was pretty concerned and asking her, oh, I'm so sorry, Grandma. You know, are, are you okay? Are you doing all right? And and the 95-year-old the grandmother said, oh, I'm doing great. I've had a wonderful life. God has blessed me with four amazing husbands. Uh, you didn't know the first three, but my first husband, he was a very wealthy man. He made lots of money, so we traveled the world together. We saw uh, incredible places throughout the world, and then he passed away. And, and my second husband, he was an entertainer. He actually did a lot of shows on Broadway and uh, we just had a great time, you know, during that phase of life. But then my third husband, he was my favorite because uh, he was a retired pastor. And before we got married, he led, it, led me to a personal relationship with the Lord. So I know where I'm going when I die. I'm going to heaven. And it's, it's glorious. But you know my fourth husband who just passed away, um, you know, he was a, a funeral director and, and we had a lot of great years, you know, just ministering to families that were hurting and grieving when someone would die. And so the do granddaughter says, oh, so are you lonely now? Are you, you hurting? And she goes, no, 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 honey, I just told you I had a great life. God blessed me with four wonderful husbands, one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. Has, oh, well, that's a pity laugh there, man. Uh, it has nothing to do with today's message. And so I heard it, and it's like, yeah, I got to. I shouldn't have, but I got to. So anyway, we are in Exodus chapter 3, and we've been looking at the life of Moses. Uh, Moses is now 80 years old at this point. Uh, he's seems to be content. I mean, we saw when he went to Midian, you know, at 40 years old, he escaped because Pharaoh wanted to kill him because he killed the Egyptian. And he thought he was going to be the deliverer as an Egyptian royalty. You know, he was adopted by the Pharaoh's daughter. He was a prince in Egypt. So he flees to Midian. And for the next 40 years, it says he was content just taking care of his father-in-law Jethro's sheep. And then as we saw last time, he goes to the backside of a mountain, Mount Horeb, and that's where God uh, ministers to him. That's where God shows up, and it was in that place of desolation that God would give Moses this tremendous revelation, and the Lord would get his attention by um, being in a burning bush. And as I mentioned, it's not that unusual in that area to see a bush burning. Either a lightning strike will hit like an acacia bush and it'll start burning and then it'll turn to, you know, ashes. Or even sometimes shepherds would, on a cold night, they would light a bush on fire just to keep warm. But Moses, he sees this bush burning and he's walking along. And then it says he turned aside to see what was going on here because the bush wasn't being consumed. It kept burning and burning. So it says when he turned aside, the Lord saw him turn aside. And so when he turns aside, that's when Moses calls out to him. We saw last time, Moses, Moses. Uh, you know, God has a lot of ways to get our attention. But again, the key is for us to, as it says there twice, turn aside. Turn aside, spend some time with the Lord in His Word. Listen to what He has for you from His Word. Don't just keep grinding out another day. Uh, don't just keep going through the motions of life, but turn aside and find out what God might have for you. D discover the plans He has for your life. And, and even though Moses... This guy that would be the great deliverer of Israel, even though he is from the tribe of Levi, uh, he knew about his forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We also see in this section, Moses really doesn't know God very well. And this is where God is really going to become personal with Moses. And so it's at 80 years old. God is going to give Moses a crash course on the nature and the character and the power of Almighty God. And at the same time, he's going to tell Moses what his plans are for the future. Very clearly, he's going to lay out for him what he is about to do. As I mentioned last week, this is the beginning of really a most remarkable relationship with God and this human being. God would speak to Moses 
you know, one-on-one, -on -one, individually, more than anybody else in the Bible. I mean, God really poured out his life, his heart, to Moses here. And God would speak directly to him. And, and, and after telling Moses, take off your sandals, you're standing on holy ground, God reveals himself to him as the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And so in Moses, it says he hides his face in fear, and then God begins to reveal his heart of love and compassion and concern for Moses and for the Jewish people. Uh, chapter 3, let's back up a couple verses. Look at verse 7 here in Exodus 3, verse 7. It says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And we went into detail about that. God sees, he hears, he knows what you're going through. And he's not a distant God, but he's very concerned. And then God reveals to Moses and us that he is not a distant God, but he, he does respond. Look at verse 8. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. And so we know that as the nation of Israel. And so not only would God start the process of delivering them from bondage, but he would also finish what he started. And again, that principle is for all of us as followers of Jesus. Philippians 1.6, a verse we should all be familiar with by now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. So what he starts, he's going to finish. You might feel discouraged and down today, as a Christian, and we can often feel discouraged or down or afraid or whatever it might be, fears and doubts, but God is faithful. Even when we're not faithful, God remains faithful. He will finish what he started. So once again, we see that God sees, he hears, he knows, and he comes down into our midst. He steps into our lives. Uh, he brings blessing. He brings healing. He brings deliverance. He brings salvation. And so he is not some, you know, distant God that's a billion light years away. That's kind of how I pictured if there was a God, he must be billions of light years away. And he doesn't care about a little peon like me. And yet God is near. He's ready. He's willing. He's able to work in us and then work through us. But now it's in verse 10, as we see in chapter 3, that God commissions Moses. God is going to use him uh, as an instrument in his hands to do mighty works in the land of Egypt. And this is where it begins. So God says there, look at chapter 3, verse 10. Come now, this is the Lord speaking, Therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Pay attention to that phrase, come now, therefore, and I will send you. If we go back 40 years earlier, when Moses was still a big shot in Egypt, again, a prince of Egypt, he was a 40-year-old man of power and authority and influence. He believed he was going to deliver his fellow Jews. I don't know what he thought, one by one, by killing off each Egyptian, you know, by his own hands. But we know he failed miserably. So after 40 years in the wilderness where he has been humbled, where he has been broken, God steps in and says, now I will send you to Pharaoh, and now you will bring my people out. And so those 40 years in the wilderness, it wasn't wasted. Uh, they weren't lost years, but God used that time to mold him and shape him and really prepare his life for what God is about to do. God has this amazing assignment for him. So now God says, I am going to send you. Now, this is interesting to me because earlier in his life, there's a different word that's used to describe how Moses went out to be the deliverer. Look at chapter 2. Scoot back there real quickly, the previous chapter. Chapter 2, look at verse 11. This is Moses on his own. He says, Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out, take note of that, he went out to his brethren, looked at their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, 
one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that way. And what did we say? His mistake was he didn't look up. He looked one way, he looked the other way, but he didn't look to the Lord. And when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So he thought he got away with it. And verse 13, And when he went out the second day, behold, two Hebrew men were fighting. And he said to one, Who did this? Who did the wrong? Why are you striking your companion? Then he said, Who made you a prince and judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? So Moses feared. Surely this thing is known. And when Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses. That's why he flees to Midian, east of uh, Egypt, and he's there for 40 years. There's a huge difference between, between went and sent. Moses went out on his own. Uh, I think we've all done that. I know I've done that. I went out and I did this and I tried to do that and I conquered here and I made a mess. <laughs> but when you're sent out by the Lord, then you have that confidence. God is sending me. I'm going to be an instrument in his hands. He can do what he wants. And so when you're sent out, then you know, okay, I got to pray about this because I know God's wanting me to do this. You got to put on the whole armor of God because you're going to be doing battle. And so it's so much more important to be sent out by the Lord than you just going out on your own. Um, it reminds me of the seven sons of Sceva. Remember them in the book of Acts? These are guys, they were Jewish unbelievers. They were watching the Apostle Paul because it says um, uh, extraordinary miracles were being done in, in Paul's, by Paul, and it wasn't even Paul doing anything. I mean, he was a tent maker. It says he had these sweat bands. He's all hot and sweaty, throw them on the ground or in a bucket or whatever he's doing with them. And people were coming by getting these sweat bands, taking them home, and demons were getting cast out of people. People were being healed. But it said that Paul was doing these extraordinary miracles. So the seven sons of Sceva see this, and so they take it on their own. They see this guy demon-possessed. We command you, in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches, to come out of this guy. And this is what we read. Look at these verses in Acts 19. I love this story because they were certainly not sent by the Lord. Acts 19, verse 15. The evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and this is where you can do your best demonic imitation, I guess. Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? I love that. I was like, who are you guys? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, these seven sons of Sceva, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. So obviously they went out in their own power, their own authority, and they were not being sent out by the Lord. Here's another interesting thing to take note of here. In verse 8, God was very clear when he says, So I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians. But notice in verse 10 here, God is telling Moses, I am sending you to do it. So I'm going to do this, God says, but I'm sending you to do it. This is very often the way God works. He can do anything and everything much better than we can, obviously. He's God. He could do it. Boom, it's done. But he chooses to use vessels like us, little clay pots. And he does whatever he does in us and through us. It's always for his glory. But it's amazing. He doesn't need us, but he uses us. And so he tells Moses, I'm going to do that. I'm going to deliver them, but I'm going to use you to do this. And we'll see that Moses gets a little freaked out by all this. Look at verse 11. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Uh, this is a question I know I've asked myself, or I've asked the Lord. Who am I when I first got saved? November 30th, 1977, North Park Theater in San Diego. I remember it like, you know, it was yesterday. And, you know, for the next weeks afterwards like lord who am i that you would save a disgusting wretched person like me who am i lord that jesus would die on a cross shed his blood for me that would give me he would give me eternal life just by putting my faith in him alone i mean who am i lord and, and then even you know before i got into ministry you know and i felt the lord calling me into ministry. who am i lord to teach your word are you kidding me let there not be many teachers among you. You'll receive the stricter judgment. I memorized that, James 3, 1, pretty early on in ministry. So you take God's word seriously. But who am I? 
I think we've all wondered that. Who am I, Lord, that you would love me unconditionally? As we'll see in a moment, the real question isn't, and because this is the first of five questions Moses has, questions of fear and doubt, and God is very patient with them initially. Uh, by question number five, it's not so nice, but we'll look at that next time. But be that as it may, who am I is not the real question, but the real question is, who are you, Lord? And that's what Moses really needs to know. And that's the revelation God is going to give him. Notice God's response to Moses' question. He doesn't answer him directly here. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and deliver the Israelites? This is what God says. Look at verse 12. So he said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve me on this mountain, Mount Sinai. So when Moses asks God, who am I? God is basically saying, Moses, don't worry about that. I know who you are. I know you're weak. I know you're frail. I know you've got struggles in your life. I know your fears and doubts. But in essence, get your eyes off yourself and get your eyes on me. God and me makes a majority, right? It's not about, you know, me doing God's will. It's about God doing his will through me. I'm just a little clay pot that he needs to work in and through, so the exact same thing applies to all of us. So often we wonder, who am I? But this is where we need to be very, very careful because where you get your answer, when you ask that question, who am I? Because the source or the person you get your answer from will determine whether or not God is going to use you at that moment for his plans and purposes. In other words, this is the difference between conviction of the Holy Spirit and condemnation from the enemy. Always remember that if there's fears and doubts, the Holy Spirit will convict us. If there's sin in our life, the Holy Spirit convicts us. But it's always to point us to Jesus. When condemnation comes from the enemy, God can't use you. You've messed up too many times. Look what you did last week. Look what you thought yesterday or whatever it might be. And you buy into this lie of Satan that condemnation, he's trying to push you away from God. God knows how weak you are. You're not surprising him with any stupid things you've done. But now you got to get your eyes off of yourself and back onto the Lord. Because we know we are new creations in Christ. We are justified in Christ by faith. His work on the cross is sufficient for all of us. He paid the price in full for all of our sins. Here he says, I will certainly be with you. I know how weak you are, Moses, but I will be with you. We have the same promise to us, Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Or as Jesus says just before, well, the last thing he says in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 28, 20, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Right? I am with you always. He says, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we have his word on it. But condemnation is when Satan tries to say, you know what, you had your chance to Moses. You blew it 40 years ago. And I can imagine Moses thinking, yeah, God can't use me. I've been out here for 40 years with the sheep. And this is just my lot in life. But again, be careful. Don't listen to Satan's lies. But listen to the Holy Spirit speaking through God's word. And here he tells Moses, I will certainly be with you. But Moses still, again, he's not convinced. Verse 13, then Moses said to God, indeed, or some versions say, behold, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? I mean, this is excuse number two that he comes up with. After saying, who am I? I can't do what you're asking me to do. Moses now says to God, indeed or behold. And you got to appreciate the humor in this because, you know, it's as if God hasn't thought this through. When he says, indeed, Lord, or haven't you thought about this, God? What's going to happen when I show up and I tell, yeah, God, this burning bush told me to come to you guys and say, you're going to be set free. They're going to think I'm stupid. So what's your name? Now, that's an important question because it shows us Moses, he's really thinking this through. He's, not, he's making excuses, but he's really like, what am I going to tell him? 
I can't say a burning bush sent me to you. So, God, I know you've called me to be this. I know you've called me to do that. But if you thought this through, Lord, you know how weak I am. You know how messed up I've been in the past. Certainly, there's more qualified people than me. But like with Moses here, God doesn't rebuke us. He doesn't get upset with us. But in his grace and mercy, he looks past all the excuses. And I have lots of excuses I, I've used in the past. And God's like, yep, it's not going to work with me. All your excuses, it's not valid. If I've called you, I will enable you. And that's true for every single one of us. So look at verse 14, one of the key verses in the entire Bible. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Again, this is one of the greatest verses there is. M Moses knew the title of God. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But now he says, what's your name? When you know somebody's name, there's a lot more intimacy. There's a lot more uh, relationship. You know, if I see somebody and I don't know him walking down the street, hey, you doesn't mean much. But if I see, oh, hey, Aaron, you know, then there's that connection. So he wants to know his name. It brings on a, you know, things to a deeper level. This will be the moment that Moses will go from just knowing things about God to, again, knowing God in a very personal way. So what's the meaning behind this name, I am who I am? In essence, God is saying, you can only compare me with me. I am infinite. Everything and everybody else is finite. There is nothing else. There is no one else you can compare God to. I am. So for almost six months here recently, we went through the book of Revelation. We saw over and over again God saying, you know, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, who was, who is, and who is to come. That's a good de definition of I am. Eternal. Who was? The same yesterday, today, and forever. That's Jesus. God says, I change not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Who was, who is, who is to come. The Almighty. When God says, I am, we respond, you're what? What are you? Well, I'm all that you will ever need. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I am your strength. I am your power. I am your healer. I am your provider. I am your salvation. I mean, I am all that you need. And so all these essential and wonderful attributes of God describes I am. And we see various attributes of God revealed to us throughout the Bible. Um, Abraham's getting ready to sacrifice Isaac because God told him to. And so he, in obedience, he takes Isaac up in the mountain. He's getting ready to sacrifice him. The angel of the Lord stops him. And then it says, God provides a ram for him. That was the sacrifice. And so this is what we read. It's in Genesis 22. Look at verse 14. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. Many of you know that as Jehovah Jireh. Yahweh Yireh, Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. We see many names for God throughout the book of Exodus. Later on in Exodus 15, 26, we'll see the Lord calling himself Jehovah Rapha. He says, I am the God who heals you. And then later in Exodus 17, verse 15, God gives Moses and the Israelites victory over the Amalekites. And so they call that place Jehovah Nisi, or the Lord is our banner. That mean, literally means the Lord is our protector. He's like a banner over us. He's going to watch over us. In Exodus 31, 13, he's called Jehovah Mekodishkem, which means the Lord who sanctifies. That's what he's done with all of it. He sanctified us. He set us apart for his exclusive purposes. Here's one you can look at, Judges 6. Verses 23 and 24, this is reading about Gideon. It says, And the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is peace. Or what? Jehovah Shalom. 
The Lord is peace. To this day, it still is an Oprah of the Abyssalites. Jeremiah 23, 6, he's called Jehovah to sit canoe, uh, the Lord our righteousness. And so Jehovah, or in the Hebrew is Yahweh, the tetragrammaton is Y-H-W-H, that's what we call the tetragrammaton. The Jews wouldn't even pronounce the name of God. It was so holy. And for they still don't even know the proper pronunciation of Yahweh. We say Yahweh, but that's probably not even what it sounds like. But it's the holy name of God. And, and that Yahweh encapsulates all of these attributes of God. So God reveals himself to us in a very personal way. I am. Again, I am your healer, I am your provider, I am your righteousness, I am your peace. Now, I don't know where you are at in your life this morning, but God does. And God wants to be I am in your life to whatever you need from God. I am whatever you need is what he's telling us here. I am here for you. So we can trust the Lord no matter what we're going through in this life. Now, the greatest name that God has revealed himself to us is the name Yahweh Shua, Jehovah Shua, transliterated Yahshua. In English, what is it? Jesus, the name Jesus. That encapsulates the entire name of God. The name above all names, remember what Paul says, Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, Therefore God also has highly exalted him, given him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth, those under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. As most of you know, Jesus Christ is the perfect reflection of, of God the Father. He is the exact representation of God the Father, the express image of God the Father. That's Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Jesus even tells us this in John 14. Look at these verses, verses 8 to 9. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. After everything, Jesus has been with these guys for three and a half years, miracle after miracle, doing everything, walking on water, giving them bread out of a little boy's lunchable, you know healing people, opening blind eyes, raising dead people. Come on, Lord, just show us the Father. That'll be enough. Seriously? That'll be sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? And not only that, Jesus claimed many times, especially in the Gospel of John, that he is the great I Am the Jews knew exactly what Jesus was saying when he says, I am. There's cults out there. That, oh, Jesus never claimed to be God. Are you kidding me? Look at this. John chapter 8, starting in verse 56, we have this amazing encounter with Jesus and the Pharisees. Jesus tells them, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. We talked about that last week when Jesus and the two angels showed up with Abraham and then the two angels leave. They go destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and it's Jesus that was there with Abraham. He says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And then the very next thing it says, they took up stones to stone him. Why would they do that? Well, a couple chapters later in John's gospel, Jesus makes this astonishing claim. John chapter 10, starting in verse 30. I and my Father are one. They're not just one in purpose. They are one. Co-equal, co-eternal, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God. Right? Right? So he said, I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works I have shown you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, notice, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. And so they knew exactly what Jesus was saying. They knew exactly who Jesus was claiming to be. And throughout his public ministry, Jesus claimed 
to be God come in human flesh. I am. And there in John, we have the seven I am's of Jesus where he says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the true vine. I am uh, the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the door. Nobody can have salvation except through Jesus. And even when Jesus was allowing himself to be arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, allowing himself to be arrested, because he's God, and he's hanging out there in the garden. He knew what's, what was happening. Judas Iscariot brings in hundreds of soldiers to arrest Jesus. Why are you coming with so many clubs and stuff? I've been in the temple teaching, and you guys are coming with all these weapons against me. And then he, Jesus says, who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. What did Jesus say? I am. There's a he in italics, which isn't supposed to be there in your Bible. It's just I am. As soon as he says, I am, what happens? Every one of the soldiers, if you want to believe in slaying in the spirit, that's where you find it. <laughs> Jesus knocks them all over, and they're you know, stumbling to get up, and they're like, okay, who are you looking for? Uh, Jesus. He goes, okay. And then he says, I am he. And he allowed them to arrest him. He was showing them, I'm God, I'm in control. I could just obliterate every one of you right on the spot, but I know why I'm here. I'm going to the cross, and you guys are going to put me on the cross. I'm surrendering my life over to you. So here we see God is revealing himself to Moses in a very personal, very intimate way. Tell the people, I am has sent me to you. Look at verse 15. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. So again, it's better to be sent than went. <laughs> uh, put that in a sentence. I went out on my own. There you go. Um, this is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. Once again, even in the Old Testament, we see the awesome grace of God on display. Even in the book that gives us the law, like Paul says, the law is good if you use it lawfully, but we see God's grace on display. God, he, he is so personal. Yes, he's awesome. Uh, the Bible, it's in Isaiah 40, verse 12. I think it says his hand spans the universe. The earth is his footstool. In other words, God is huge, massive, yet he so personally comes down. He says, I visit you, and I want to hang out with you. I want to spend time with you. He says, I have surely visited you. Remember in verse 7, God says, I have surely seen the oppression of my people. I have heard their cry. I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them. So it's now time for God to visit his people there in Egypt. Once again, God visited his people 2,000 years ago in Israel in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, who's the Word? Verse 14, John 1, 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt, tabernacled among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But it wasn't just 2,000 years ago that God visited us in the person of Jesus, but even today, Jesus wants to visit you. He wants to visit with me. He wants to hang out with us. And when he does, he always brings whatever we need, whatever we need most, I am. What do you need today? I don't know, but God does. Comfort, encouragement, strength, boldness to proclaim the word of God, joy, peace, hope, love, as the angel told Joseph, when he finds out Mary is pregnant, you shall call his name Jesus, for he'll save his people from their sins. He's here to visit you. He wants to forgive you. Two verses later, in Matthew 1.23, it says this, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. 
He's not a billion light years away. He is here in our midst. Wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in your midst. And so if you ever feel blue, if you ever feel abandoned or lonely or forsaken or forgotten, call out to Jesus. He would love to visit with you. So here God tells Moses what he has for him and what he's going to tell the elders there in Israel and then what they're supposed to tell Pharaoh. So look at verse 17. We'll go through this quickly. This is where God gives him the whole outline for what's going to happen in, in the next 10 chapters or so. He says, And I have said, verse 17, I will bring you out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and all the other termites and parasites in the land there, right? To a land flowing with milk and honey. Then, again, this is God giving his instructions to Moses, the whole plan, the whole outline. Then they will heed your voice. So the Jews are going to believe you, and you shall come, and you um, and the elders of Israel to the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, and you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us, and now please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Then God says in verse 19, But I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not even by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in its midst. And after that, he will let you go. So the ten plagues there, God strikes the nation of Egypt. And that final one, the death of the firstborn, will finally be the straw that breaks Pharaoh's back. And they finally will leave. And then he says in verse 21, And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. By that point, the Egyptians are like, Get out! Let them go, Pharaoh! We don't want this anymore. And so I will give the, this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be when you go that you shall not go empty-handed. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor, namely of her who dwells near her house, articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. And as you know, all that wealth would be used to build the tabernacle there in the wilderness. So God gives Moses the whole plan here. Moses, let me answer your questions by telling you in advance all that I'm going to do. God does that in his word. Again, we just went through Revelation. We know what's going to happen. At least I hope you know. I hope I didn't waste six months of my life and you're like, right, what's going to happen? No, no, we know we're going to have the rapture. At any moment, the rapture is going to take place. We're out of here. The bride of Christ taken up in glory to be with the Lord. The trumpet will sound. The dead will rise first. Those who are Christians who have died, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall be with the Lord. We'll be there for seven years. What's happening then? Revelation 6 through 18, the great tribulation. The Antichrist comes on the scene. He comes to power. And God will pour out his wrath, his judgment, which were promised, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. We're not destined for wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus our Lord. Romans 5, 9, much more than having now been justified by faith, we shall be saved from wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, they were to wait for Jesus, who would deliver them from the wrath to come. So we're not going through the wrath, but... God's pouring out his wrath for seven years, and all you can spend trillions of dollars all you want on saving Mother Earth and trying to direct or change climate change. God says, no, I'm the authority here. I'm the ultimate weatherman, and he is going to cook planet Earth, literally. Every sea creature we saw is going to die. Every green grass is going to die. Every tree is going to be burned up. This world's on the brink of annihilation at the end of seven years. 
It's about to be toast for good, and yet that's when Jesus comes back. Re Revelation 19, starting in verse 11, door opens. Jesus comes on the white horse. Then the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, which is the righteous acts of the saints. You and I, the bride, follow him on white horses. He brings an end to the great tribulation. The Antichrist, the false prophet, they get thrown into the lake of fire for a thousand years. Satan is locked away for a thousand years. And then we have 1,000 years or the millennial reign of Christ. He's going to turn this world that is, again, on the brink of annihilation into a Garden of Eden-like state, again, for a 1,000 years. And then Satan's let loose for a little time, it says. Micros Kronos, a very t short time. He deceives many people. One final battle it basically says God smokes them, and that's the end of that. And then... God's going to vaporize the entire universe, including planet Earth. Don't waste any of your money trying to save Mother Earth. You can't. Father God is going to wipe it all out. It's going to be vaporized, literally. Read 2 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 10. And then we're going to watch. He's going to create an entirely new universe, new heavens, new earth, in which righteousness will dwell forever. Now, we'll be in our resurrection bodies throughout the eternity. How do we know this? Because God has told us in advance what he's going to do. He's telling Moses in advance what I'm going to do. Here he says, the people will heed your voice. You'll go to Pharaoh. You'll say, let my people go. He's not going to listen to you. And so I'm going to bring a mighty hand. I'm going to stretch out my mighty hand with signs and wonders. Eventually, he'll let you go. The Egyptians will give you all this money, gold, silver, clothing. So God is simply reminding Moses he keeps his promises. He's already, hundreds of years earlier, promised Abraham. He promised Isaac. He promised Jacob this promised land, the land of Israel. And it hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen through Moses taking them to the border. So Moses, it's not about you and your faithfulness, your strength. It's all about God's faithfulness and his strength. You might think at this moment that chapter 4 would start off, and we'll look at this, Lord willing, next time. You'd think Moses would be saying, all right, Lord, you've got this. I can't wait to see what you're going to do. Hallelujah. But he's got three more questions of doubt. I don't see how you're going to do this, God. I just don't understand. What in the world? I, it's impossible. Unfortunately, that's not what we'll see. Moses has questions. He has fears. He has doubts. In other words, Moses is still a lot like me. And I'll say you too. You know, we don't have it all down. In fact, we've been given a lot more details from God than Moses had. Moses spoke to him more than anybody else in the Bible. And Moses was used to write Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch, the first five books. They're called the five books of Moses for a reason. How many books do we have? 60, 66 books. we got the whole Bible. God revealed everything he wants us to know from Genesis to Revelation. Praise the Lord. God doesn't need to give us any more details I just gave you a bunch of details from Revelation. We don't need any more details. We need to simply trust God because of who He is and for all that He has done for us. It's like when our daughters were, you know, four or five years old. And then when our grandkids, are, when they were like four or five years old, you know, Elizabeth and I could just say, hey, let's go to the park. And they would just get a smile on their face. They'd be beaming, let's go to the park. Not once did they ever think, well, I wonder if dad, I wonder if grandpa knows where he's going. I wonder if the car is going to start when he turns the key. You know, I wonder if he's going to abandon us when we get to the park. Those things weren't in their mind. They had us by the hand. They're like, we're safe. We're with grandma and grandpa. We're with mom and dad. We're going to the park. We're going to have fun. I wish I had that childlike faith. Just take me by the hand, God. Take me where you want to go. I just trust you. You know, I don't need to know all the details. I praise the Lord. He's given us so many details in his word. I mean, we've got the doctrines. You know eschatology. We've got all these things. But just to hear God say, here, take my hand. Trust me. Walk with me through this life. That's all you need because you know his heart for you. 
He's revealed his nature, his character, his mind, his heart to us through his living word. So bottom line, spend time getting to know the one who made you day by day. It's a never-ending process. I don't know everything to know about God for sure. We see through a glass dimly today, but then we'll see him face to face. And I look forward to that day. I hope you do as well. Come on down.